Post-employment benefits. Now this is quite a tricky area and we're going to look at it, which hopefully will provide you some information, not just for this subject, but also for if you have to make a decision around your superannuation, how it works. So post-employment employee benefits are employee benefits other than termination benefits and short-term employee benefits that are payable after the completion of employment. Post-employment benefits include retirement benefits, so things like pensions um, and other things. Now, for most of us, as I said before, superannuation is a big one and it is a pretty damn important thing to be aware of. Um, so it is important to be aware of what's going on with the superannuation and how it all works. But I was reading about, just doing some reading up for this week, and, and I wanted to know, because you always hear about politicians and the perks that they get, you know, and they get treated pretty well afterwards. So PMs, so, and Julie Gillard obviously falls in this boat, though she will get something, her pension will be, set, I think it was 75% of, per year of, what her salary was, sort of her, her last sort of salary level. So if she was making like three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars a year. And I think that's what she was making as PM. She will be getting something like two, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year for the rest of her life. She can still obviously work, but you know that's not a bad place to be. Um, that said, I mean I wouldn't want to do the job that she did. Um, I think that would be, I think it'd be horrendous doing that sort of work. But. She also gets things like offices, she gets staff, she gets free air travel for life. Like she gets a lot of perks, as does all the previous prime ministers, as will most likely prime ministers to come. Unless the politicians themselves decide, well, hang on, this is probably a bit of largesse, maybe we should cut back on it, which I can't really see happening. So they do pretty well. Um, what we're worried about is the retirement benefits being the superannuation stuff. Recognition and measurement. So post-employment post benefit plans are classified as either defined contribution plans or defined benefit plans. That word con defined contribution and defined benefit become really important. And think about it from the English perspective. You have defined, what's important is you've defined the contribution, so what is being put in, and one defines what is coming out. Those are the two big differences. So if you think about, as we go through this, think about the obligation, think about how much, you know, what the obligation is on the company. And you record it as a liability after deducting any amount already paid as, and as an expense unless another standard, yada, 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 yada. So it's the same thing that we saw with wages and some of the other ones. So it's a similar concept. What's different though is this next bit. And I will read it out may not make a lot of sense, but we will read it out and then we'll actually figure out what this means in plain English. Defined contribution plans, it is the entity's legal or constructive obligation is limited to the amount that it agrees to contribute to the fund. Thus, the amount of the post-employment benefits received by the employee is determined by the amount of contributions paid by an entity together with investment returns arising from the contributions. In consequence, actuarial risk and investment risk fall on the employee. This is what I always get confused. It's either 70% of the money invested or 70% of people. But pretty much, if you're an Australian worker and you have superannuation, you will be getting this sort of plan. Now, this isn't the two plans, defined contribution and defined benefit, aren't a choice between you know high growth or balanced or sustainable within your superannuation option set. It is that all those options are within this set. So this is a completely different thing from defined benefit. Defined contribution plans, at the end of the day, you are on the hook. If things go well, giddy up, you've done well. If things go badly, you're the one. And we saw this with a large number of Australian workers about four or five years ago. When markets crash, superannuation funds lose a lot of money people lose a lot of super, people end up having to stay in work a lot longer and delaying retirement. That is because the risk falls on the employee. And we're going to see how that works and we're going to see what a defined benefit plan is as well. Now it's not to say all is well and rosy with defined benefit, but it's useful to know what the differences are. Now whether or not you can choose between them in a real sense at the jobs you go to, that's different because a lot of employee, employers don't offer this. So this is defined, 
So it's the contribution which is defined, and we'll come to that. Okay, so we have the company that you work for, we have the super fund, and you have the employee. You work for the company, so you do work, and you get paid $100 a week, per day, per hour, I don't know. If you're an English football player, per minute, I don't know. They get paid a lot. So work. Now in Australia, the statutory requirement to pay superannuation is 9%. Now some companies will pay more, um, and some companies will pay substantially more than that, but they've got to pay at least 9%. Oops. Now, I always get confused if it's 9% of that, but let's just call it 9% on top of that. Um, which probably doesn't exactly make 9%, but... So they're going to put 9% into your superannuation fund each period. Your superannuation fund goes off and invests that. Now you have a general kind of, you can choose the general mix of that investment structure. So if you want it to be high growth, you can choose that. If you want to choose to be cash, you can do that sustainable, whatever. That's where you get to make the choice in terms of the, the sort of investments that they go off on. But ultimately, they will invest it and there'll be fees taken out of that and you know, there'll be some sort of return. At the end of the day, now let's just assume, just for simplicity's sake, you're going to get some sort of lump sum. And that money that you get out will be based on the contributions that got put in. So... the contributions that get put in and affected by the returns that came out. So, you know, if the superannuation fund is really good asset managers, if the markets, if they've got really just ordinary asset managers but the market's going well, then you're going to do well and the amount of money coming out to you is going to be pretty good. If the money going in and they do a really lousy job or they're just unlucky and we saw that with the financial crisis. I mean people, the ASX dropped about nearly in half and you saw people, you know, if you had a million dollars in super, you know, and were just about to retire and people were in this boat, you thought you were going to retire on a million dollars, suddenly turns into $500,000, like overnight, well obviously not overnight, but fairly quickly. I mean that would be devastating, like that would be just a horrendous thing to have happen. So, the risk ultimately falls on you in that case. What the company is obliged for, and if you look at the first, the first, well, second line, the obligation is limited to the amount that it agrees to contribute to the fund. As long as it is putting in that $9, now if it's agreed to put in $12, as long as it's agreeing to put in that $12, that's it. It's good. Now, not every company does that. Nathan Tinkler is having some problems. I mean, he's having some problems with the Knights. Like, they don't know quite what's going on with the money. He's having some other problems as well. But there are companies up in Newcastle saying he's not paying our superannuation. There are issues there. That's, that's the obligation that they have. As long as they're putting in that money, all is good. If you end up penniless and broke because the superannuation fund has lost all your money, that's not the company's issue. So with this... As long as they put in their $9, does the company have any obligation to you if the superannuation fund has no money to pay you? No. And that's why, the, that's why the obligation is limited. And you can understand why something upwards of 70% of Australian companies are going down this track. Because it limits their risk. So a defined benefit plan is very different. As I said, it's getting rarer because obviously if the other ones are getting more popular, this is getting rarer. You will see it with older companies, so companies like Qantas. Um, in the ASX 100, around about 60% do have some sort of defined benefit plan, but generally a lot of them that still do have them have restricted access. You can't, you can't join them anymore. They have stopped people coming into them. Um, the other big place where you see defined benefit plans being used is in the public sector. 
So public, se public sector jobs, universities. Um, I'm on a defined benefit plan, so I can speak of this. The entity's obligation is to provide the agreed benefits to current and former employees. So that's the obligation. It's not just to chuck in the money. It is to provide the agreed benefits. And we're going to talk about how this works. So in this case, the risk falls on the company, not on the individual. Now, there's a downside to this, and we'll get to that too, but that means I as an individual have less risk in terms of my outcomes if I stay within the university sector. So the benefit, the benefit is defined. So what we have here is the company, super, and the employee. The employee works $100. Could be the same employee, could be the person sitting next to him. You know those superannuation ads where it's like, same job, same salary, same age, different outcome? That's not this case. Like these are actually on completely different plans. This is just, that one's just a choice between different superannuation. It's between industry super and retail super. That's actually something different. Um, but for all intents and purposes, you could have the same person doing this work. So two people side by side, they're throwing, they're earning $100. There are $9 of contributions going in. These guys go off and invest it. So for all intents and purposes, that process is really similar. It won't be identical because the way that they would invest this would be different because the risk involved for the superannuation fund is different. So they would be looking at different mixes of assets. But in terms of the general idea, they go off and invest it. Yeah, that'd be the same thing. Now, this is where it does differ. Red doesn't really come up as a different color, does it? No. Oh, well. What I get... So my benefit, now I don't actually know how much I'm going to get. And this is assuming I stay within the sector. But my benefit is a function of my final salary, years worked, and a whole other bunch of factors which the trust or the superannuation fund have put together. But the key one well, two key things about it. What it gets defined on in a large sense is what my final salary is and how many years I've worked in the sector. What it isn't defined on is how well or how badly the superannuation fund have invested my money. They could have done a really poor job. How much I meant to get out in a theoretical perspective is based on how much my final salary was just before I retire. Technically, for, for the superannuation fund, I mean, they averaged my last five years and they'll work it out on that, but it's, so it's not the very, very final one, which I suppose stops people kind of fiddling around and being like, hey, just hire me for the final year for like, you know, lots and lots of money, and then it'll just get worked on that. So over five years, it's harder to kind of manipulate the system. Final salary, years worked, doesn't matter what's going on here, theoretically. Reality, I've actually found out it's a little bit different than that, but that's the idea. So what happens is if these guys don't necessarily have enough money to pay out, not just me, but all the other people they owe money to, there is an obligation from the company to that super fund to make sure that that works. Now that's pretty tricky to figure out how much you're dealing with and that's not something we're going to look at. But you can imagine if the assets that they've got, and if you've got, um, if you just got the slide in front of you instead of flicking and flicking back, under its defined benefit scheme, more than 13,000 former and present Qantas workers are guaranteed fixed payouts. So Qantas, you know, that's a lot of people that will get guaranteed payouts, even if the markets fall down. For defined contribution plans on the next slide, it's as the service is rendered. So for this, it would simply be debit some sort of expense, credit, K 
cache. That would be it. It's as the service is rendered, it's just like paying some sort of salary expense. It would just be a little bit extra expense on top. If it is a defined benefit plan, the expense recognized for a defined benefit plan is not necessarily the amount of the contrib contribution due. So yes, you would have an expense for that, but then you may also have some sort of expense, some sort of liability for what they think the issue is with how much they're obliged to make sure that you're looking good. And that calculation is, is very complex and the way it's accounted for is very complex and it's not something that we're going to be looking at. To do this, the company at the bottom of that slide, to do this you need to look at the plan assets of the superannuation fund. So they need to have a look at their assets. And so if they look at all their market, all their securities and everything they've invested in, that shouldn't be too bad. But let's say they get to $1,000. Then you look at their liabilities, all the things that they owe all their various employees. And that happens to be, in today's money, $1,200. They're $200 out. But the thing is, a lot of those payments may not happen for 30 years. So you don't just recognize a $200 expense now. You've got to figure out how that's going to work through. And if the things improve, you've got to build in the fact that things may improve as well. If you're starting to think about how you do that, it is really complicated. So we're not going to go, we're not going to go and have a look there. But the main thing is just to think about if you get the choice, depending on where you go to work, is there a choice that has to be made between defined contribution and defined benefit? At UTS, there is. You do get that choice within, and you have to make it, and then you're locked in after 12 months. Um, at, other, at some employees, you may get that as well. Some you just won't, and you'll get this. Yes. Isn't that why the federal government created uh, what they call the future fund? The future fund, yeah. So that's the future fund is not for all of Australia. The future fund is just for the the private, the public sector. And I don't, know, don't even know if it's all of the public sector. It's just to make sure that there's enough money to pay out their guys. They blew it anyway. What's that? They blew it already. Right? Well, I'm not getting. <laughs> I, I can't really comment on that, but yeah, I mean, yeah, but that is why the future fund, it sounds awesome. It's like, yeah, you know, we're investing, it's not for us. It's for their superannuation. Um, other long-term benef employee benefits are all employee benefits other than the short-term employee benefits, which makes sense. Post-employment benefits and termination benefits. Other long-term employee benefits include long-term paid absences. That's the one we're going to focus on. Um, I don't even know what Jubilee, I, you know, obviously it's, obviously it's a thing, but I've never heard of it. <laughs> the amount recognized as a liability for other long-term employee benefits shall be the net total of the following amounts. Now, this is where I'm making, you may or may not agree with me on this, but I'm going to make a call on it, and I think given the timing, it makes sense. I'm not going to run through the practical demonstration today. Um, the reason being is threefold. One, the document that's provided is relatively well laid out and you can see the steps that work through with it. Two, there will be a video working through that document which will kind of cover what I'd be saying in class anyway, uh, which will be about 10 minutes long. Um, it would take longer to do it in class. And three, it is not for the mid-semester exam and so by the time you sort of get around to finding it useful, you know, there are more pressing issues and what I would like to do around the mid-semester exam will take about 45 minutes and I think given current things at hand is probably a lot more beneficial in the short term. So if we're going to have a little bit of time at the end of that, if anyone does want to talk to me about the practical demonstration, I'm happy to do so at that time and want to stick around. If you've got other questions, happy to do that. But I think that's, that is the way that I want to play it. Um, I would say is everyone comfortable with that but I've got a feeling everyone will I'd say yes or just stay silent, so I'm just making an executive decision. The present value of the defined benefit obligation, that is just coming out and the reason a long service leave, and if you have a look at the demonstration at some point in time, just remember this, that it's, it is a defined benefit because it is defined on the salary. It's not defined on how much is getting put into anything, it is defined based on the salary involved. So that's why it's a defined benefit. In relation to long service leave, there is no plan assets. It's just you have someone working for, you think you're going to work for a long period of time. You figure out basically the present value of what, that, what the weighted average of that liability is. And then 
that's what you show. There are no assets sitting against it. It is just the liability. If it's in it, you do it as an expense, unless it's required to be an asset, which is just like everything else that we've seen. And that's not the computer I need. Termination benefits are employee benefits provided in exchange for the termination of an employee's employment as a result of either a decision to terminate an employee's employment before the normal retirement date. It was Holden that's shutting down, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So when a, fa when a factory shuts down, um, they obviously lay workers off and there will be payments to those workers because they've laid them off. That's what that's talking about. Those guys didn't expect to be laid off. It is before the normal retirement date. Those payments would be termination payments. An employee's decision to accept an offer of benefits in exchange for the termination of employment. That's voluntary redundancy. Um, now, so luckily I didn't know, I personally didn't know any of the, any of the staff over at Sydney Uni that took it or offered it, but Sydney Uni a couple of years ago had people, had offered quite a number of people voluntary redundancy. Um, that's, that's what we're talking about there. Um, in a way, I don't know, it's always hard, like each, not even, like, I wouldn't, generations are a sweeping thing, but it, this sort of, you guys as a group going forward, are coming into a slightly better economic environment than some of the people we were teaching probably about four or five years ago, who, who were coming out into the teeth of the issues with the GFC. But grad positions were hard to find then, and people were getting positions and then basically getting told, here's three months, pay, we don't need you anymore. Um, so I mean that was pretty hard, and I had I knew people and sort of even people who weren't grads, but people in jobs that were getting basically f not fired, but offered redundancy packages and, and were take and had to take them. So how voluntary it is, I don't know, but you know it wasn't good, um, and some of them took a long while to get back up on their feet. That's what we're talking about there, um, in terms of when you recognise it, and I don't think that's so much of an issue for you guys. There are other issues that people coming out of the workforce now are facing. It's not, it's a different, it's a different beast though. Um, which, as I step away just from ASR for a moment, I'm not necessarily saying beta alpha psi, I mean it's a very American thing using Greeks, but um, that chapter of stuff, stuff like that, that if you're looking for jobs, that if you're sort of getting your CV ready for, you know, grad recruitment processes in a year or two's time, that stuff is useful. Whether it's that stuff, whether it's business society trying to get internships, looking at what's out there, that stuff is really useful. That's what employers look at. So think about it as you're going through. And I'm not, I have no invested interest in that group at all. Um, but just think about trying to build what your CV is. Because it's not just what's on your transcript which becomes important, it's that other stuff too. But I've got a sense that quite a few of you guys are working anyway. So to that extent, you're already doing that. An entity shall recognise liability and expense for termination benefits at the earlier of when you can't withdraw the offer anymore. Now think about that from, if you can withdraw the offer, then there's no obligation at this point because you could decide to withdraw the offer and there's nothing pressing. If you can't withdraw the offer, then you are going to be paying something out. There is an obligation. So that's the hook there. When the entity recognises cost for a restructuring, um, we're not so much dealing with the restructurings this semester, but that's for completeness. You measure termination benefits on initial recognition and shall measure and recognise subsequent cha changes in accordance with the nature of the employee benefit. Um, so just whatever is going on with it really. Um, and we, again, we're not spending a huge focus on this. So that brings us to the end of employee benefits. Yes, there are some important things to think about in terms of provisions and liabilities. So think about that. Um, as you roll forward into Saturday. We looked at liability, we looked at um, how, we, how we treat employee benefits and, and we looked at some of the primary issues around accounting for employee, employee benefits. So there is something, I believe it is useful when I've done this before, you wanna stick around, it'll take about 45 minutes. It'll give you a good level of feedback as to where you're at for Saturday. If you don't wanna stick around for it, I can understand that as well. Good luck for Saturday and I'll see you guys in three weeks time. But for those who are staying, we'll be getting going in about five.